Well, this is Ian Anderson from Jethro Tell. Welcome to the Ian Anderson Q&A on the website jethrotell.com. I have a few questions from a few people here. And uh, it's a sunny Sunday afternoon here in England. I should be out walking with the cats. But never mind. Nothing is more important than your questions, especially this one from Tom Fashing. Apparently, we get a lot of these on the website. Hello, Ian. Will you ever consider recording with the other band members present in the studio with you again? Although it may be an inconvenience, you bet it is, it seems that the wealth of years that all of you have put in could, uh, and a little input and a lot of improvisation might make this recording a special one. Well, that's actually what we do. And um, um, about half of the Jethro Hotel Christmas album was indeed done with the band members in the studio playing live pretty much as we would do playing on stage. We, we rehearse that way, and when we come to record, we record it that way. But the stuff involving Don Perry, and this gets to the inconvenience part because he is a Los Angeles person. Um, that's the bit where we have to use the trickery of the modern recording studio and ship hard disks and musical parts around the world. So he could do his bits over there whilst uh, the rest of us did our bits here. Because uh, sometimes if you're just coming in for a couple of days of work, it's a, it's a week out of his lifetime by the time you've got on an aeroplane and crossed the Atlantic. And, and uh, Don's had a lot of... Uh, a lot of personal and family problems this year, so it didn't seem fair to be uh, taking him away during the last uh, months. Um, so uh, that's why we did that way. But no, recording together is what it's all about, and that's always the best way. Here's a question from Mick Larkins, who says, uh, As one would conclude by the many questions on this board, it is widely accepted that the peak of Tull's musical sound was, with its pastoral folk albums of the mid to late 70s, especially with songs from the Wooden Heavy Horses, aside from the departures from the Tull lineup with the arrival of the 1980s, why did Tull decide to basically abandon the folk sound for the favour of synthesizers? I'm really pleased with the return to the woodsy sound of your latest solo albums and the Christmas album. I also really enjoyed the Rubbing Elbows show. It was the most unique and satisfying concert I have ever attended. Well, thanks very much, Mick, old son. Um, I don't think we've ever abandoned folk music. Folk music is, is, I mean, folk music to me was what I was listening to as a teenager. Only back then, black, back, back then, it was black. Then it was black, and it was, it was uh, Muddy Waters and Howling Wolf and Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee. But that, that was folk music of North America. That was the, the black, uh, the black Negro American tradition of, uh, of all that happened from uh, days of slavery through to the commercial sounds of the uh, of the 60s when of course uh, in those very early 60s when I started to listen to it so that was folk music of a kind I was also brought up in Scotland where we sang church music and folk music so historical music and the music of other people it's always been you know something that's fascinated me and rock and roll and the contemporary thing that uh, Jethro Tull did at the time we started and, and, and moved on through the years. We, you know, we try to bring in other kinds of influences from the world of folk, and maybe that came through loudest and clearest on the um, Songs from Wooden Heavy Horses albums, but, but they, did, they did lay it on a little thick, you know, kind of Englishy folk thing. And, and whilst there are elements of that, obviously, in the Jethro Tell Christmas album recently, and maybe odd little moments in our live performance that, that allude to a more folky kind of performance, then uh, I don't think it's ever gone away. It's, it's, it's there, and sometimes those folky echoes get louder, and then sometimes they just grow quieter again for a while. But I think all the music I've ever done has never really left me, and even the synthesizer-y, sequencer, sampler kind of things that we experimented with um, in the very early 80s, when that technology was shiny and new, it's still a part of Jethro Tell's music and inevitably part of the recording process, not only for us, but for, for every every band or artist that records today. You can't escape the realities of digital um, digital recording and processing. It's, it's, it's what we do, like it or loathe it. And um, when it's done well, it's pretty good, very, very useful. God save digital and all who sail in her, especially when it's 24 bits as opposed to the CD 16. Felicia, Felicia Villiers says, Dear Mr. A, in a few songs, wine is mentioned. <laughs> and is it me being weird? But I've noticed white wine more often than red. What a perceptive Felicia this is. 
uh, a personal preference or does it just work better lyrically? Well, I told you it was a stupid question. Um, well, yeah, probably because I do drink white wine rather than red wine and wine, I don't know, it, it just goes goes back all the way, doesn't it? Probably the first thing, the first alcoholic beverage I ever drank was a sparkling white wine. Um, sort of little baby imitation champagne called Baby Sham. It was the first thing I think I ever had. So, yeah, it goes back to my, my childhood and celebrating Christmas and things at, to, with the family at home. And wine in the biblical sense, and wine in the... Uh, in the uh, in the geographical sense, it's the reliable drink when you travel around the world. Sometimes, uh, sometimes you can be a little disappointed, especially drinking white wine in faraway places like India, which is not known for wine production. Um, it can be a little rough, and um, and uh, but you know it's good. And now wine wine comes into the lyrics white more often than red. Absolutely right. If I drank more red wine, then it would be in the lyrics more often. But I don't, so it won't. There you go. Well spotted, Felicia. Not to say that every song mentions wine. I think we've had a little... I think we've mentioned whiskey. I think we've mentioned... Uh, have we mentioned beer? I can't remember if we've mentioned any beers. Probably not by name, but if you want a good beer, Pilsner, Pilsner Urquell from the Czech Republic is a very good one. Um, and, of course, the old standby, Beck's. Fine, uh, straightforward uh, German beer. Ah, Alexander Haas from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. His question, in considering the albums from Aqualung through the songs from the wood and approaching the subject matter, how would the changing times affect your approach to these subject areas now as opposed to then? And how would you overcome the challenges presented by the present times in addressing these subjects, whether from religion to whatever? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I guess at the moment... Um, smarting from the uh, <laughs> the stings and bruises of uh, of a few outraged um, Americans last year, I guess I guess I'd be inclined to be treading a little warily. Um, I mean, I've actually just written an 18-minute-long piece of music, which does definitely touch upon uh, the sensitive subject of uh, of conflict of peoples of varying persuasions, varying. Um, ethnic background, various religious beliefs and cultural diversity. It, it's, it's a subject that's never going to leave me, just as it never leaves the screens of CNN. Um, but I guess right at the moment, you've got to tread warily. People are very, very twitchy, not just in the USA, but, but over here as well. And, um, you know, I, I, I guess it's, a, it's an area that I can't escape. It will inevitably come back. Social, political religious and uh, world affairs are bound to creep in around the edges of my lyrics and my musical thinking. But, you know, I'm going to have to be awfully careful not to be, um, not to be taking sides or trying to, to preach at people. Um, it's really a question of just giving a glimpse into perhaps another angle, giving a Giving giving some solidity of thought perhaps here and there, but without without uh, falling into the error of of, um, of preaching, and that's all too easy to do. Especially you know, especially if you're sitting uh, sitting in a bar with friends talking casually, then you know things can get sometimes a little too political and a little too outrageous. So best to keep that for barroom talk and and not uh, not let it get to the uh, not let it get too deeply involved with your craft or your art but uh, by the same token it wouldn't be it wouldn't be honest to keep it out altogether just part of growing up learning how to do it sensitively <laughs> oh, question from jack graffing or grafing um have you ever thought of doing a rarities type of tour where you skip playing the usual songs like aquiline and loco and play things you normally don't i think many of us have seen tell many times and if you advertise it as a rarities tour people would know what to expect well, yeah, they probably would, and they'd also know that for a lot of them it would be a good opportunity to stay at home because, <laughs> like it or loathe it, there are a lot of people out there who are seeing Jethro Tull for the first time and or the second time and not for the tenth or the hundredth time and for whom going to a Jethro Tull show and not hearing us play the the, the real classic Tull songs like Stay Away to Heaven and, uh, and uh, Smoke on the Water, you know, it would be really gravely disappointing to them. So I guess the the trick is that 
we try, and I hope reasonably successfully, from tour to tour, we, we try and mix it up. We, we bring in some of what I think you might describe as rarities, um, and we play some of the the things that are occasionally heard from you know from time to time on a Jethro Tell concert, and then we do play the the two or three or four whatever songs we happen to be playing. But Aqualung and Locomotive Breath are almost always going to be amongst them. There are one or two more that frequently appear, like Living in the Past. But um, you know, it's it's about mixing it up and trying to give the big picture of Jethro Tell. Um, trying to pick songs that are stylistically representative of the broader body of work and and to avoid just playing the same 20 songs all the time, every tour, year after year. So we try to find that balance. Tricky job. Sometimes I think I should have been a politician. Uh, from Peggy Harris. Ian, it was great meeting you and show in Durham, North Carolina. Thank you for the autograph and picture. Ian, are you now playing the type of music you you once, your once younger self imagined you would create. Um, I don't think I really imagined what sort of music I would create, and um, I think, think writing music is, um, you never really know what you're going to come up with. That's what makes it exciting. That's what makes it an obsession. It's that you don't know what the answer is. You don't sit down saying, I'm going to write this kind of song, and I want it to come out just like that. I suppose you do if you're making, um, you know, hits for MTV. But none of you are doing what I do. It's 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 a mystery. It's a it's a magical mystery tour, and uh, and no one knows quite what's at the end of it. And if it doesn't work out, will you get your money back? Probably not. A question from Carol Harry or Harl. Is there any chance in the near future that we could be hearing reasons for waiting? Fire at Midnight, Summer Day Sand, Slow Marching Band, or Cold Wind to Valhalla. In the set list, perhaps in the next tour, please say yes. I'm tired of waiting. Um, you have so much more to offer than Aqualung and Locomotive. Yes, and uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, the concert was great. Well, thank you, uh, Carol. Um, well, and the ones you mentioned, uh, you know, we have done those reasons for waiting as has appeared in Jethro Tell concerts in the past. It's on the on the list of things to to be chosen from again. Fire at Midnight, another one we've played in the past. Some of those sounds I don't think we have. Slow Marching Band probably played it way back when. Cole Winter Valhalla, we played some of that once uh, a while ago. But it's a tricky one because it involves uh, radically retuning guitars. So it's not that practical to do on tour unless you bring a separate guitar just for that one song, which I'm too lazy to do. Um, but yeah, you know, there's some of these songs and indeed uh, many more that you could have mentioned are on that... Uh, on that big list of about uh, 150 songs that are the ones that are seriously likely to be drawn from on tours. And from time to time, that gets amended as we discover, oh, we could play that one after all. We haven't done that forever. Like uh, recently we started playing the song called, it was on the Christmas album, and it wasn't Fire at Midnight, it was the... Um, uh, the kind of folky songs from Wood Heavy Horses kind of song, which entirely escapes me at the moment, but it's just so damn good. It's probably my brain shutting it out, so as not to um, not to uh, not to give the game away for me next time I play it, when it'll be a total surprise to suddenly have it flooding back in my mind. No, it's still not going to come back. It's a great song though. Uh, <laughs> from uh, maybe it was maybe it was Carol Hart. That's who it was. Was it Carol Hart? Carol Hart? Yeah, maybe it was Carol Hart. Um, from Lou McMillan, with the success of the Osbournes on MTV, what are the chances you, Shona, the kids and the cats might score your only family reality show? The Andersons could be big on Animal Planet. Mm. Well, the thing is, in, in our household, it's actually incredibly boring and normal. You know, we don't really have... Um, we don't really shout. We don't have fights. Um... Nobody's terribly badly behaved, including the cats, and so it would be a it would it would be the kind of reality show to send people to sleep, because it's just so incredibly normal and so incredibly boring, probably to the outsider. It would have absolutely no commercial value whatsoever. But um, in that way, you know, we're probably like I would hope, like most families, you know, nothing nothing very exceptional happens. And if you ham it up for the cameras and invent, you know scandals and outrage and bad behavior and a lot of four-letter words, then um, I suppose you could make a lot of money. But um, I don't think that's quite for me. Privacy 
and uh, and an honest family relationship are really much more important than um, than being on TV, especially on um, MTV or whatever, which I don't have a lot of time for, as you possibly know. Uh, from Paul Farmer. Over the early years of your career, you've shared with us your carnal side. It's not running around, it's not running down a nose, willy kissing, late night roll your owns, uh, feminine curse laments. Hmm. For the last few years, I've seen a more mystically minded Ian with quite a number of spiritual ideas expressed in albums like Roots to Branches, Divinities, Rupees Dance, and even Secret Language of Birds and Dot Com. Well, there was a penis on the cover of that one, he says in brackets. I like it all because I don't necessarily see carnal and spiritual as always being mutually exclusive. And I'd love to hear you talk a bit about the carnal and spiritual in your life. Are you in a state of flux? Um, no, Paul. Um, I mean, the, the, the carnal side, the sort of naughty side. Let's not call it carnal. The naughty side, the silly, smutty schoolboy side is just a, it's actually probably really a bit tedious. But it's it's the odd belly laugh, it's the odd bit of fun, it's it's the odd little twinkle in an old man's eye. Um, it's schoolboyish. It's 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 sort of dirty old men um, all at the same time, and a little bit of that is okay, and a little bit of that is fun, and some of the stuff that crops up in lyrics, whilst it may be, um, it may on the face of it sound like it's a bit naughty or a bit smutty, but you know, I, I like to think it's usually there in some way to reflect real life and the real world, just as elements of things a little more spiritual or esoteric are, I hope, by the real life too. And so, yeah, they can, they can live happily side by side. Um, I'm not sure if, um, if Jesus ever heard a, a dirty joke or, you know, um, doubt that he ever told one, otherwise it'd be in the Bible, wouldn't it? Um, but you know, I, I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think we have to sort of shut that stuff out. It's just um, difference, difference in in listening to comedic thought and in enjoying and sharing a belly laugh. It's it's when it when it when it becomes part of your cruel reality in the way you interface with people, then it gets a little scary. And so, all we've got to be careful if you're a if you're a if you're a funny kind of guy talking about sort of rude and dirty funny kind of things, then um, it's it's just a it's just a moment of entertainment. When, once once you get too deeply immersed in that stuff, it, it gets to be pain in the ass for everybody, and and possibly kind of overtakes your um, you know, the better parts of your personality. So, like most of what I've been saying, you know, it's all about keeping it in balance, isn't it? Um, uh, Dan Shettini. Um, says, uh, your opinion on the recording industry, lawsuits on downloaded internet songs. Well, I mean, it does seem incredibly heavy-handed, doesn't it? And um, I'm not sure whether scaring people off is the way to uh, change their habits. Uh, I think it's um, it's on a par with sort of going in guns and tanks blazing into Fallujah, isn't it? Whoops, no, I said I wouldn't talk about those sort of things. Um, it's more about, um, I think it's more about educating people that, the copyright, which is something enshrined in, in quite a long time, quite a long period of history, copyright is something very precious to the artist and to those people who commercially have the right to uh, to use that copyright in their business of making music, movies, plays, books available to the public. And it's there for a reason. It's not just to make a lot of people a pile of money because a lot of people who only have very moderate success depend desperately on that copyright to to receive royalties from their work and um, remember most people make records for example it costs a big big pile of bucks to do it and you're not going to get paid back usually for quite some time to come even if a record company give you an advance it's only an advance set against the royalties they hope you will earn in the future and if you don't make those, uh, if you actually don't actually manage to achieve enough royalties to cover your advance, whilst the advance is not usually returnable, it is recoupable and maybe recoupable from future records you make if you don't make it back from the record against which that advance was given. So, you know, nothing is for nothing. Most most musicians really do depend upon it. And although some people make obscene amounts of money, and you know, I suppose by by some standards. 
I've made obscene amounts of money, but it's all the, all the folks who make not so much money but still depend on that system. That's why the system is important to keep alive. And therefore, um, and it's important also for the record companies to have that right to make a profit. No one wants to see them being rolling in dosh, but if record companies are not profitable, there will be no new artists because without profits, they can't invest in making the records, in the marketing, in the promotion, in the distribution of new artists. So if we want to see new artists and we want to see the future of rock music and pop music continue into the future for future generations, then we have to see record companies making some kind of profit. And in a naturally dwindling uh, uh, economy for music, given all the, the alternatives we have to spend our money on, that copyright protection is something that really I would like to see go on. But I guess the Apple folks have shown the way. iTunes and uh, and its other more recent imitators are probably the way to go. And so paying a small but meaningful amount of money to download music does seem more appropriate and more satisfying. And, and um, you know, 99 cents a track. Hey, you know, could you could you say, could you put your heart or your hand on your heart and say that... Um, Smoke on the water wasn't worth 99 cents to you, you know, or um, a whiter shade of pale or or Jimi Hendrix singing Purple Haze or or Led Zeppelin singing uh, one of a, a dozen great tracks. I mean, 99 cents for to have that forever. Boy, it seems cheap at the price to me. Well, there you go. So um, Bob Martin, Bob Martin. Have I ever journeyed to Key West and visited Hemingway's abode to see his uh, his cats? Well, interesting that because uh, actually my wife and I very nearly did go to Key West, and we actually still have it on the uh, you know on the list of things to do. And uh, yes, I did know about the cats, and uh, I'm a sucker for cats, feral cats living you know kind of wild and relatively in a, in a rather parasitic way in in in, um, in city society and. Um, you know, you you always get broken-hearted because you befriend some little animal and feed it or bestow some affection on it, knowing that its chances are probably not that great in the long term. And um, uh, so it's one of those things you know you get get uh, get a little uh, a little uh, a little upset about uh, when you have to leave those little fellas. Um, same with little dogs. Met, met a real I'm not a big doggy person. I met a really nice dog on a beach in India. Um, about two or three months ago, and um, it was just a puppy, and you know it might survive and it might not, but it was actually just a really nice little dog. You know, very nervous, but once once we'd made friends with it, it was um, it was a real pal, and happily, if it did have rabies, it it uh, if it did have rabies, it didn't bite me. So um, took a chance and uh, and did what I don't usually do. I fondled. A dog. Yes, I admit it. I was, I was friendly to one of those stinky, slobbering canine things. <laughs> we have two of them who live here in the house, and uh, and um, you know, nice enough chaps in their way, but uh, I'm a pussycat kind of person. Ah, Rick Fontaine says, whenever I watch the 20th anniversary video, it's kind of heartening to note it won't be long now. And we're nearly doubling that mark. Mm -hmm. um, right. Um, from what I read, you seem keen on continuing as long as you're able, which I think is great. But do you ever consider how you'd like to mark Tull's swan song when the time comes? First record by its own title was conscious of being a first document of who you were. What kind of statement might you like to ascribe to your last album? And for that matter, what kinds of things might still be on your wish list for when your career might, or where your career might take you musically, geographically, or otherwise? Well, goodness me, you're not going to think about um, planning your own demise, surely. It's a bit like writing an epitaph. I mean, uh, no, I, think, I, think, uh, I think whether I have a year or ten years or whatever in front of me, then... I'm not going to start thinking too consciously about uh, this is the last one. This is time to bow out, and, and this is a, a contrived exit. I think, um, and I have thought, and I still think, that if I found I was not going to make it, if I had some terminal disease and a few months to live, I, I, I might well record some music. I might well do another tour, but I don't think I'd be... I don't think I'd be going out there to make it something um, specially um, 
and directly attributable to the idea of of death. Um, no, I think I would just carry on until uh, until the Grim Reaper tows me away, without uh, without getting too um, too poignant about that uh, that moment in terms of making music and writing lyrics. Now I think I'll just wait till it happens and carry on doing what I'm doing until then. Karsten Bergman asks, is it obvious? No, it is obvious. <laughs> Sorry, this is a photocopy here, so I'm stumbling over words. It is obvious that you and Jeffrey were and are very close friends. I would like to know how Jeffrey inspired and affected your views on art, music, life, etc. during your teenage years in Blackpool, during those very creative Tell years, 71 to 75, and what were your feelings when he left Tell? Come on, be honest, in brackets. I always wonder how director's input was as an artist, not musician, because Tull were very special during those zebra years. Yes, Jeffrey Hammond used to wear a striped zebra suit. Um, in fact, um, he used to juggle with balls that came out of a zebra's bottom. The zebra was a pantomime zebra composed of... I uh, can't remember who the front half was. I think the back half was Dave Morris, one of the, one of the audio technicians who worked with us in those years. Yeah, Jeffrey was uh, was a, was a school pal uh, when I was about 16 years old. I think when I first met Jeffrey, and um, we shared an interest in art, in the visual arts, and uh, I persuaded him to attempt to play bass in our first band that we had when we were at school with John Evans, Jeffrey, myself, and an assortment of fourth members. Um, but Jeffrey wasn't really that mad keen on. Uh, on pursuing music because a he didn't feel sufficiently able enough as a musician and b he did prefer to uh, to paint and draw and so we all went off to seek our fortunes in the, the big city down in london and jethro tell was formed by which time jeffrey had gone to art school down there and so um, we met up again in the early days of Jethro Tell. Jeff used to come and see us play and was a, a supporter of the band, um, a slightly eccentric character, usually out on the fringe of the audience in the Marquee Club. And um, and then when Glenn Cornick left the band in six in seventy, nineteen seventy, I persuaded. And it took a lot of persuading. I persuaded Jeffrey to to join the band just really on the eve of uh, of the, uh, the start of recording of the Aqualung album. And he hadn't played bass other than that little bit back when we were 17 years old. And um, and so had to be taught, really, everything that he played on that album. And uh, when he joined the band, he made it very clear he was only going to stay in the band for a limited period of time until he hoped he would have made enough money that he could um, uh, afford to... <laughs> retire and become a full-time painter and that is indeed what he did and he counted his pennies and by the time 1975 came along he decided it was time to go and um, he made no secret of the fact he was leaving we all half disbelieved him and thought he would change his mind but he he was resolute and and uh, it was with great sadness he um, but that we said goodbye to him after his last tour and, uh, and since then he's never picked up the bass he sold all of his uh, musical possessions and burnt the striped suits outside the, the venue after the last show and turned his back on music forever to become a, a painter and that's indeed what Jeffrey has done since then and yes we still see Jeffrey as we have over the years a good friend tragically lost his wife um, last uh, year and uh, so Jeffrey's on his own and has uh, moved back up to the area around Blackpool where we first met in the north of England and um, and there's uh, I think you know just undergoing that period of readjustment in his life and hopes to carry on painting and uh, and I'm sure you'd love to see his paintings but weird thing is he doesn't ever show them to anybody so he's just sitting there with hundreds of paintings in his house and um, Never has any exhibitions, never sells any, so it's uh, kind of strange. But you know, he made his decision a long time ago, and um, and we're good pals, and a lot of loyalty, you know, there. Not only from me, but John Evans and Barry Barlow, who I see from time to time, you know, still, uh, you know, kind of loyal friends to Jeffrey, and um, and we're all, um, you know, as we get older, we, I think, see the positive sides of our our past musical relationship even though those guys don't play music anymore and uh, you know we still keep in touch 
Um, we could crack open a beer and talk about old times, except we're not that sort of people, really. Um, Okie dokie. Um, that was uh, Karsten. Uh, Christopher. Christopher Sin. In the early 90s, you gave an interview about your flute playing in which you revealed that thanks to your daughter, you discovered that you'd been using incorrect fingerings while playing the flute for all those years. You said you felt that some immediate action needed to be taken and consequently you learned how to play it properly. That was a long question. It was about time you're playing and the approach to flute turned a corner. It was also the time you started implementing bamboo flutes into your songs. Um, um, blah, 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 blah. Uh, more of the flute is in the music now. Arguable the level of difficulty has increased. Did proper flute playing lend itself to the direction of your music? Um, blah, 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 blah. Why the decision to use bamboo? Blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, the thing is, I started playing the flute really as a thwarted and, 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 uh, not confident guitar player, I thought I should find something else to do, which is what, why I took up the flute, age 20, just at the time Jethro Tell began, and uh, put the guitar aside for a, a while, started playing acoustic guitar, since it was the instrument I used to write the songs on, particularly around the time of the Aqualung album, when the more acoustic side of Jethro Tell's music sort of came back into the fore and formed an important part of the Aqualung album. But for a long time, Flute was a trademark, it was something I did, it was something I enjoyed, but I had limitations and, and felt felt more more of a songwriter rather than just being a flute player. You know, that was what I did, but it wasn't all that I did, and, and so I try to keep the flute in perspective, that it wasn't the most important thing. The most important thing was the end result, the whole song, the whole arrangement, the band playing together. And it wasn't really until probably around uh, the mm, early part of the, the 90s, that's the 1990s, in case you were wondering, um, that I started to face up to the uh, the little difficulties and frustrations that I had in playing the flute, which turned out to be, and you're quite right, my daughter is the one that pointed it out to me when she was young and taking flute lessons at school, uh, that I wasn't playing it using all the correct fingerings, and therefore some of the problems I had of intonation, of uh, of clarity of sound, etc., were were to do with having just been self-taught and never 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 really known what what you were supposed to to do um, by by the book. And so um, I did spend about four or five months really working on my flute playing, trying to learn to do it properly, but without losing the thing that I, I had done all those years previously. So what I play now is um, mostly orthodox in terms of fingering, but I do use the odd, uh, you know, sometimes use harmonics and uh, things that are probably not in the classical repertoire that, that give me that rock edge. <laughs> and also, you know, I reminiscent of some of the, the use of f flute as an ancient instrument in, in the other folk cultures um, around the world so bamboo flutes and other kinds of uh, um, primitive wooden flutes are a part of what interests me increasingly about the instrument so I think of myself I think of myself much more as a, as being a flute player these days who happens to sing and strum a bit of guitar but um, yeah I, I got a lot more serious about it and that that on balance has to be a good thing because I do find I pick I pick it up and practice and I pick it up and play things for fun really every day uh, it's not um and i keep it clean i keep it all shiny and polished and and swab it down afterwards and uh, disinfect it <laughs> do whatever needs doing to a to an old man's flute um so i do take it a lot more seriously yeah, and i have a lot more fun with the instrument and uh, do enjoy it uh joseph t sustrick i am a 53 year old youngster that fell in love with the jethro tell music when i first heard it on the radio in the u.s either in 68 69 or 70. Um, early college years, memory somewhat foggy. To date, he has almost all of the Tell Arms CDs, with the exception of one or two, very similar to my Beatles collection. Here's my question. Well, I thought it was coming sometime. With all of the great creativity you have in writing music and to play with some of the best in the world already, why do not Ian Anderson and Martin Barr, together with the others of your choosing, team up with Paul McCartney and write and produce some fantastic songs together? A mix of your talents would be astronomical. Please consider it. Well, you know, Martin actually has played with Paul McCartney. He was summoned to put by Paul McCartney to take part in some recording session once. I uh, don't think it ever saw the light of day, but uh, Martin has actually been in a recording studio with Paul McCartney and 
and strummed his guitar for Paul. But I never actually met Paul McCartney and, and was frankly never much of a Beatles fan. And, and in that kind of Lennon-McCartney um, musical diversity that was so important to the Beatles, I guess I always kind of fell on the side of um, favouring uh, the Lennon kind of music. It just seemed to have a little more edge to it. There was a little more something cynical, sometimes funny. Paul was a little bit more, um, you know, just a little bit more organized, a little contrived, a little mundane, very skillful pop songwriter, but, but somehow lacking that edge that Lennon had, which I guess is why they worked so well together when they worked together. But those sort of relationships rarely go on forever, and uh, Paul Sims has done his thing, and frankly, it's not my thing. So um, I don't really think we would have much of a... Um, a com m much musical compatibility, I think. Uh, and anyway, Paul McCartney's a big, big star, and out there doing his uh, his Paul McCartney plays Paul and the Beatles music to to adoring uh, young and old audiences throughout the world. And and you can understand he's a bit older than me, and you know he, he's he's going to want to do that until he drops because he's got a lot of places to go, a lot of people to play to, and. And I think is probably hugely enjoying live performance and uh, and continuing stardom. Um, I don't think Paul's in the kind of mood to be collaborating with uh, oddballs like me, who don't really think in uh, in pop music terms. But thanks for the thought. You know, if if John Lennon was alive now, then then maybe <laughs> then maybe I would uh, I would uh, um, certainly answer the phone call if he was to. Uh, to call me. Now then, uh, Dave K, just Dave K, I think, um, is, uh, says, what was this song about when Jesus came to play? Uh, and, um, well, uh, um, I have no idea, actually. It was, um, I don't I think I think we probably played it on stage just around the time of the release of that album, which I think was Catfish Rising, wasn't it? Um, but uh, yeah, just just one of those songs that sort of touch upon um, Christianity, the role of Jesus, the folklore of Jesus, the myth of Jesus, and the real man Jesus. Um, which I guess is what really fascinates us about Jesus. He was a real fella. He wasn't just some some mysterious uh, smoky being, some uh, some uh, spiritual force somewhere deep in the bowels of the universe. <laughs> he was a real, real person. A real person had to widdly wee, dumpy do, had to feed himself, had to, uh, you know, got upset, got got pretty pissed off sometimes. So that's what fascinates us about Jesus. That this. And and why he seems uh, somehow touchable and reachable, and yet and yet distant and remote, and uh, all at the same time. That's uh, that's the mystery of uh, of taking the great prophet and and deifying him. Um, why is it always a him? I don't know, in world religions, we don't don't have too many um, seriously important female gods or minor. Um, acolytes, do we? Well, they just don't seem to exist. Um, funny old thing, that. Um, so, don't really, can't remember too much about it, frankly. Sorry about that, Father Dave. Um, Tommy Kvarsvik, imagine that someone gave you a time machine and you decided to travel back in time to 1968. What do you think Ian Anderson, who had just recorded this was, would have thought if you gave him the opportunity to rip his dance for the Christmas album? Um, Probably would have thought, oh boy, that sounds a bit difficult. I don't think I'm going to be able to play that. But you know, that was um, that was then, and starting off, as was so important about starting off playing or imitating Black American blues, was that it gave you the opportunity to find your way in music, to start off with simple motifs, simple ideas, simple elements of improvisation, and. And you could build upon them and develop them and find some of the joining up notes and joining up rhythms and, and harmonically, you know, take it off and be a little more adventurous and get away from the, the three chord trick, the 12 bar blues. So, yeah, it's, um, you know, I, I guess looking forward from that and thinking about the enormity of, of the uh, musical 
the variety of different musical types and sounds and influences and techniques that, that had to be absorbed over the next 20 or 30 years, it would have seemed very daunting. But, um, you know, I guess it would be if you're a doctor. <laughs> you, you start off on day one thinking, oh, I don't think I'm going to be able to remember um, what that bit's joined onto. And if I had to cut it out, would I cut out the right bit? Um, if I had to remember the name of all the drugs, I'd never be able to possibly remember them, know what to prescribe. Well, it's all daunting until you actually get it into your thick head. Just like music, you've got to start somewhere, you'll learn as you go along. Hey, Robert Rookrig? Robert Rookrig, Riggle? Riggle? Rookrig? Uh, odd name. Robert, anyway, Robert from Coram in Long Island, New York. Um, forgive me with the names here, but you know it's a photocopy here, it's a bit blurred, and I sometimes can't really make out the names, which are probably pretty damn weird anyway. Hello Ian, if you were to write an album where from the get-go you knew it would never have to be performed live, what sort of music might we hear? Would you write it in the same keys you used to pre-1984? Now you tell them much of your current material with a live show in mind, keys that are easier to sing, not too hard on the voice, the one that even your in your heart you'd really like to have belted out like you were 21, but touring realities make that not possible. Um, yeah, that's, that's um, an interesting topic, but you've got to get this one in perspective. Um, there are certain songs, and believe me, I'm not the only one to do this. I think everybody does that in the recording studio, you know, when you're relaxed, when you're hydrated, when you're, uh, you know, fully capable of it extending and going out on a limb, um, that one day in 10 or that one hour in 20, uh, that you feel particularly good about your performance and you can just go that little bit further, you record a song in a key that really is just, you know, going to be seriously difficult to replicate on stage. And a lot of people do that and, and are forced either to dodge the high notes by changing the melody a little bit just to sing something that harmonically works but just dodges the odd high note. Um, or maybe you just don't sing so many of them. Um in sequence, so it's a little easier on the voice. Or maybe you actually just take the key down a, you know, a, 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 a semitone, two semitones, whatever, to make it uh, to make it a little easier. And and I do that and have done it since recording many of the Jethro Tell songs. You know, they've they've been done a different way. But there are some songs that that probably I now always sing a little lower than I did. Aqualung being one of them. Um, locomotive breath, on the other hand, another one we play every night in concert, is in the same key, same tune, sung just just the same as as I did it when I recorded it on the record. But you know, I don't I don't have a very big range in my voice. I mean, I only have a useful, um, I mean, not even not not even a useful two octaves. I mean, I'm really limited. Most people have a strong two, two and a half octaves. Some people can sing confidently three octaves, you know, and I, my voice is a baritone. I'm a Bing Crosby. I'm a baritone kind of guy. Um, there aren't many of us in rock music. Probably David Bowie would spring to mind as also having a, a naturally lower set voice than uh, the typical rock male. And so, um, you know, we, we tend to uh, perhaps have more limited range and we perhaps uh, are a little more cautious with what we do on stage, knowing how easy it is to damage the voice and playing night after night after night. But um, I think what I try to do is, is not think about keys. I mean, I'm songs sound good in certain keys, and so, you know, you construct a melody um, where it, it works for you in a given key. And maybe you think, well, okay, I can do this on the record, but when it comes to doing it live night after night, then I'll just, you know, pitch it lower or maybe just change a line of the melody to make it easier to sing. We all do that. You know, I'm sure it happens in classical music too. I'm sure there are, there are probably some kind of almost official dodges available for opera singers that, you know, on a night when they know they're not going to confidently sing that high C, that there are acceptable alternative... Uh, um, melodic moves you can make that people say oh you know, the, the, the 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 wise and super aware will say oh yes Pavarotti didn't sing that part you know he sang you know he sang the lower note instead of going for the high note they'll spot it whereas of course I wouldn't not being an aficionado of that kind of music but I'm sure that must happen I'm sure there are I'm sure there are sort of semi-official ways of dodging the issue but that doesn't mean that 
you know, from the point of view of the, the spirit, the, the, the essence of the song, the emotion behind the song, the thought behind the song, the, the heart and soul of the song, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're giving people secondhand goods. <laughs> it just means that you avoid making too much of a fool of yourself by failing to, uh, to hit the high notes. And, I, and I've actually worked with some singers um, when I've just been you know, playing with other people. Um, as a member of the band and i've worked with some people who i i know are absolutely struggling and my my heart goes out to them because i know from a personal point of view you know if you're if you are if, if you're stuck with it you know you're really going to feel humiliated when you come off stage and you've done a terrible performance and uh, and so um singing other people's music it, it's, it's probably a lot harder if you're singing your own music you probably have ways of uh, <clears throat> getting around it but uh, not when you're working with other people's material so um it's it's a tricky one but hey you know i i, I still uh, sing the jethro tull repertoire and uh, i would guess um you know things uh, songs like you know, heavy horses too old to rock and roll locomotive breath living in the past you know these things are all in their original keys and uh you know, one or two things that uh, that I play are are uh, are dropped, uh, you know, uh, um, semitone or a whole tone. Um, I've even done aquiline actually in uh, in even a lower key where we in an orchestral version where the whole nature of the song is changed, the whole arrangement is changed because it suits it. It's not because I can't sing the high notes; just suits it having this rather more somber um, way of uh, of doing it. So uh, yeah, songs songs want to be in a certain key, and by and large, you try and stick with it. If you have to cheat, drop it down a little bit. Hey, that's what we do, you know. That's what we do. And um, don't like it? Well, tough. You know what? Um, bum 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 bum. Carl Myers says the serious one, the electric tell albums, a broadsword, etc. Hmm, electric. Seem to have a love more hate and reputation amongst fans. I happen to enjoy them myself as well as walking to the light. What's your opinion of the works after a couple of decades have passed? Um, and what did you take away from that era musically? Um, I think I'm not sure what you mean by electric there, uh, Carl. Um, a was uh, was kind of very uh, synthesizer. Eddie Jobson was a keyboard player. Uh, Broadsword uh, was. Broadsword is an album, you know, that that's much more um, I think that's much more of a typical Jethro Tull album myself, you know, quite 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 uh, European little folky things and ideas come into that one. Um, um but, you know, sure the two albums that I like, I'm not sure that uh, that I quite understand what you mean by electric because uh, even, you know, albums like uh, more recent albums like uh, Roots to Branches or dot com or whatever you know we're still using those same kind of instruments they're still very much electric i think if anything maybe the division is that jethro tell as a band recording will tend towards more electric recordings because martin bauer is primarily an electric guitar player and andrew giddings plays electronic keyboards and so the electric stuff is kind of the band and the more acoustic things i tend to um tend to construct for solo projects and um, music that is essentially just more acoustic and more um, um, more the kind of music where I don't have to worry about including those electric instruments because um, I know that uh, I don't want to disappoint the members of Jethro Tull by saying well actually I don't really need you on this track if you don't mind just sitting at the far end of the studio and reading the newspaper while I finish recording it without you um, wouldn't go down too well so you know, I think I try and include the other guys in more of a, more of an electric context, and when on stage performing some of the acoustic stuff, they have their arms twisted to play accordion, <laughs> not the most popular instrument in town, um, or backstage at a Jethro Hotel concert. Um, it's um, it's it's really you know I suppose pushing people to do something that maybe they're not so comfortable with anyway. I think they enjoy doing it on stage, but it's just not what they really enjoy, which is playing a lot louder. And, you know, Martin Barr is a rock guitar player. That's what he enjoys doing. And whilst he does play acoustic guitar as well, I, I, I think I think he doesn't enjoy it nearly as much as playing electric. So that, to me, is a, an indication that I write music to include Martin that's going to be 
electric stuff primarily and uh, keep the acoustic things um, more likely for solo projects or the little acoustic bits that we do on stage which um, um, sneak their way into a tell set. Terry Worth. Terry Worth says, Ian, could you tell me who are your heroes, who do you look up to and why? They may not necessarily be musicians. Uh, met one of my heroes actually a couple of weeks ago <clears throat> at breakfast in Germany. His name um, is uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. And uh, Gorbachev is probably for me kind of an important guy, especially today, because with the wisdom of an elder, uh, if somewhat despised statesman, at least in, in his own country, um, you know, the, um, the there's an authority and a presence about him which hasn't disappeared as he's got older. He's, he's a very strong and forthright person, but he's also a listener. You know, he can look you in the eye and listen to what you say, even though he doesn't speak English, but be an interpreter. And, and I'm actually just really reassuring to meet somebody that you've admired over the years for his... Uh, I mean, you could say he saved the planet, couldn't you? You could say Gorbachev is the man who, without necessarily quite intending it to go exactly that way, he did dismantle the Soviet Union. He, he set in train certain um, certain events which uh, were undoable, which meant for those of us who'd grown up in the Cold War years, genuinely fearing, you know, nuclear holocaust. Um, he is the man that, that set the ball rolling towards peace, integration, and almost democracy, um, which Russia enjoys today. And um, I think he's a very, very important man. I, I hope the history books remen remember him a lot more kindly than, um, than his peers have. Bill Clinton, I think, is still very much his chum. But then Bill Clinton probably needs chums. And um, he'll certainly find one in Gorbachev who spoke warmly of Bill Clinton, who had sent Mr. Gorbachev a letter only recently, just uh, keeping in touch and being in a friendly kind of uh, um, uh, peer group, uh, old politician, old leader kind of uh, uh, club. Um, and I guess some of those folks, having had the opportunity to sit back and look at what they've done, good and bad, probably do have a an ongoing vital role in influencing world events in the future. Gorbachev at the moment is uh, less politically motivated than environmentally motivated. And uh, if you ever get a chance, go and visit his uh, his uh, uh, charitable website, uh, Green Cross. If you look it up on a search engine, you'll find uh, you'll find uh, evidence there of Mr. Gorbachev's great passion in uh, in um, being very active in various aspects of world uh, conservation and ecology, which um, one hopes, uh, you know, will have, through his authority, some chance of success where politicians, especially with with uh, elections looming, can't always afford to do the right thing if they're going to win the next election. They've got too many people to please. So Gorbachev doesn't have to please anybody anymore. He just has to walk around with his ex-KGB armed guard because a lot of people still want to kill the poor old man. <clears throat> so he's one of my heroes. Muddy Waters, if he'd been at breakfast as well, uh, Beethoven maybe, then uh, between Beethoven, Muddy Waters, Gorbachev, um, we would have, uh, we would have, uh, we would have, we would have sat down and enjoyed a high cholesterol breakfast. Now then, uh, who's we got? We got uh, somebody called El Nino, I suspect, not, not the real name. Uh, hi, could fans hear a web bro broadcast of the following recorded but unreleased songs? Oh dear, Dinosaur, DJ, The Instrumental Endgame, 8.40 from Nowhere, what's that? They've recorded Andy Giddings' Parrot, also known as Clint Eastwood, the song with no name. The 23.com songs, which are not on the CD, thanks, from El Nino. Um, I think I could confidently say, no, you've got no chance whatsoever, really, with any of those... Um, um, I know we rehearsed Dinosaur once because it was a bit of a tongue-in-cheek dig at people who back then, just being in the um, 1980-81 period, you know, people were speaking disparagingly of uh, of classic rock bands as dinosaurs. And um, whilst I think, you know, tongue-in-cheek, it's not a bad description, I kind of go along with it in a way. And uh, I think at that time the song was written really just to kind of make fun right back at those people who were having a little dig at 
us and who else? Genesis, Pink Floyd, all those folks. So um, it was um, it was just a little little uh, little having a go back. But I have to say those kind of songs, you know, where you actually answer critics in a way and come back at people on a personal level, you know, it it you do it and it feels good at the time, but it's not it's not a message you want to carry on repeating. You know, you 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 you've, you you're on the record. You've you've made your response, but that's it. Leave it alone and move on. I don't think it's a song I'd want to sing on stage every night. Um, so uh, there you go. Um, from Eric Van Rin. Uh, several of your songs seem to refer to real life incidents. I was hoping you might share the events that form the background of Wind Up, Big Riff and Mando in particular. Um, well, Wind Up is just 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 a song written for the Aqualung album, rather in the same vein as My God, a song that I was singing really about me as a 14 year old and my reaction to uh, um, the sometimes heavy handed and career dominated approach to uh, bringing up children, schooling them and directing them down a certain uh, course in life. And whilst in, uh, in hindsight, most of that wasn't too far off beam, it's natural to want to rebel against it. And, uh, and I didn't really rebel against it when I was 14 or 15. I waited until I was uh, 23 <laughs> and uh, decided then to uh, just use some of those teenage emotions in, uh, in the context of a song. And, and, and sometimes I think when you do write songs, it's quite a good idea to go back over your earlier self and examine some of those emotions and thoughts and reactions that you've had in the past and, and then kind of put them into the present you know, in a, maybe a different context, but it's a good way of keeping in touch with your earlier self. It's all, it's all part of recognizing honestly who you were, and 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 how you become what you are now, and and, and examining your own past as a way of creating a benchmark for for what you are now, and also considering what you might become in the future. Because we do change. Some things we st stick with resolutely through life. Some some things we we kind of go off somewhere and, and take on a few new ideas. But it's important, I think, for all of us to have a sense of where we've come from. And that's what those uh, those songs are really about as a 23, 24-year-old writing, um, writing songs that were kind of examining my early teenage years again. And uh, and so, yeah, they're, they're, they're real songs. Big Riff and Mando is just about a real-life incident where Martin had his mandolin stolen from backstage by... A thief, <laughs> um, and uh, we went on went on a local radio station after the show. We went. Martin was really devastated, really upset, and um, he said, "I lock up my instruments in my dressing room all the time, every time." And uh, the other guys in the band, they just kind of leave them sitting there. You know, it always amazes me they don't get them stolen every night. Uh, anyway, on this occasion, Martin uh, did get his mandolin stolen, and we went to a radio station and pleaded with whoever had stolen it to 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 return it because we needed it for the shows next night and, and through the rest of the tour because it was a handmade instrument, you know, not, not one you could replace by going to the local music store. And indeed, it was handed in late that night or early the, early the next morning and um, and um, the person who did it was, uh, I don't, don't think was rewarded in any way, but um, neither were they prosecuted. <laughs> so so uh, I think uh, it worked out okay. And uh, Martin still probably has that mandolin to this very day, although I doubt if he's played it very much since. Um, uh, uh, William Rohali. Rohali? I just attended the Rubbing Elbow Show in Hasburg, PA. I have to say it was amazing. You were great. The band was very, very tight. Uh, it was worth every penny I spent and more. Oh, right. Um, I did take notice being a bit below you and in the second row of your shoes. They were right spiffy. And I was wondering what kind they were, so I could get myself a pair. <laughs> well, but, you know, I do, I know what those shoes are. Those shoes, those shoes, which I actually still have and, and have been wearing even recently, come to think of it. Those were a pair of shoes I bought at the airport when I was heading off on, a, on one of those rubbing elbows tours. And they are made by a Swiss company called Bally. Not ballet, not the uh, not the dance in tights and the bulging genitalia area, but the uh, ballet, B A L L Y, and they're kind of expensive. They're probably uh, about two hundred and seventy dollars if you would find them somewhere. But uh, you'll probably find a ballet shoe store in New York or L A or something, and they'll 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 just charge you a fortune. 
um, or Atlanta. I do know of a ballet store in Atlanta. Um, anyway, but uh, you never know. They're probably just um, no longer the hot seller, so they may just be in the next ballet sale. And they're kind of, um, yeah, they're kind of smart, but um, uh, kind of comfy, slip on, kind of, you know, just the right, right sort of balance of being dressy and uh, and practical when it comes to getting them on and off in a hurry backstage when you're struggling into your um, out of your wet clothes into uh, into uh, civilian wear. Ba -ba 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 -ba. This is from Blue Smith. Um, hmm. Um, I, uh, I combine two questions. I am Blue Smith of Laurel, Maryland. I'd like to know if you could be kind, if you could be any kind of cat. What kind of cat would you be? And would you like to see some pictures of my new kitten, Gordy? Um, well, I'm not sure that I would like to be a cat. Um, if I had to be a cat, then I'd want to be a cat in our house because they have a pretty good, uh, they have a lot of room to, to to move around. You know, big house and then big outdoors. They've got kind of ten acres of fenced off area that they can call home. So they have a pretty good uh, um, and relaxed um, life. And they are always in the company of other animals with whom they live fairly happily side by side. Chickens and dogs and sheep and horses and, and, and uh, fish. And, and, um, and uh, you know, cats are kind of okay and good, 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 good pals, good, good members of the family. So I would be one of my cats. I don't think I'd want to be a wild cat because, um, on average, you know, if a, if a litter of, cat, of cubs is born to a wild cat, big or small, whatever, whatever uh, species, you know, the chances are that, you know, one was going to survive out of, you know, maybe a litter of three or four or five cats. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's nature's a rough, rough place, you know. So I don't think um, it'd be like being born a human before the age of antibiotics, um, <laughs> you know, the odds wouldn't be quite so good, would they? So if you were a cat, you'd want to live with me, trust me. Um, uh, Ed Jennings says, um, what are your plans for rubbing elbows three, 2004? Well, actually, I don't have any because I'm on tour with Jethro Tell most of this year, apart from some orchestral shows that I'm doing in uh, Italy and Germany and France. Um, uh, only really doing one rubbing elbows-ish kind of show in Edinburgh uh, in August, I believe the 20th, if you happen to be in Edinburgh, I think it's the time when Edinburgh Festival is on, good time to go to Edinburgh. Um, but uh, yeah, mostly on tour with Jethro Tell this year, and um, and uh, and uh, Ed would like me to add the format to include more about my interests and take some multimedia tributes to Jethro, or see some multimedia tributes to Jethro Tell. Reminisce about life on the road with Taliban members you've become friends with over the years. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, I'll think about that. And um, But, you know, the whole point about doing the rubbing elbows thing is it's just got to be off the cuff. And I don't really, don't really start off with prepared speeches or, or, or reminiscences. That's not really what it's about. It's more about kind of dealing with the here and now, the... You know, playing the music and then having questions from audience and and topics and and things that just are completely a surprise because you don't know what's coming next. That's why it's fun because it's conversational and it's real, and um, and not a rehearsed um, delivering of lines and anecdotes and um, and uh, and the reminiscences part, which I'm not very good at. Really, I don't reminisce readily or happily. I think about the time's gone by, but only f only for long enough to get get it in perspective, and then uh, don't like to dwell on it, and don't particularly want to share it with other people most of the time. Um, so, if you another question was, you know, would I write my my autobiography? The answer is I don't really think I've got enough to write about, because most of most of my time is actually spent being a bit of a loner, and therefore there aren't so many players in my autobiography. <laughs> You know, it's a small cast, <laughs> and um, and a lot of them don't have lines to say anyway. <laughs> so uh, yeah, another reason I've done an autobiography. Um, <laughs> oh, and then moving on to where we after Ed. Okay, we're with Jeff Stone now. 
How would you equate your obvious love and concern for the animal kingdom with having made a lucrative nest egg from slaughter and in the past supporting others in hunting for sport? Where do you stand on the blood sports and in particular fox hunting and the countryside alliance? Well, goodness me. Um, I haven't made a lucrative nest egg from slaughter. In fact, I've been involved, involved in aquaculture as a fish farmer. Um, and like other farmers who farm livestock of any sort, then you do get to that moment where you have to say, I am not a vegan, I am going to eat the flesh, and I'm going to have to kill it first, since it's usually a lot more convenient when it's not trying to escape from you while you're biting into it. So, um, it's just slaughter. We actually call it harvesting. Uh, we don't... Uh, you, slaughter, you slaughter cattle, don't you? You slaughter sheep in a slaughterhouse, but... We uh, we fish farmers are uh, <laughs> altogether a, um, uh, a more sensitive bunch. We refer, refer to it as harvesting, and so we harvest the bounty of the sea, um, and uh, they're quickly uh, whacked over the the snout, uh, which is how if you're a fisherman and you ever caught line caught fish, you'll know how to kill a fish, hopefully quickly and hopefully painlessly. Um, and fish are also sometimes anaesthetised with carbon dioxide. Um, which uh, puts them to sleep uh, prior to uh, cutting them behind the gills, whereupon they are bled, not because we're uh, kosher, but because uh, getting the blood out of the fish means that it can be uh, safely transported in ice and uh, with much, much reduced bacterial action, so the fish stay fresher longer. Um, but I don't do that anymore. I haven't been doing it, actually, for, for a few years now. I sold, leased, and merged my aquacultural interest with other companies and I have really nothing to do with it on a day-to-day -day level and haven't done for a while. Um, so I'm not actually involved in that anymore. Um, but I do eat fish and I don't eat that much meat. I eat a lot of vegetables, slaughter the hell out of them. <laughs> if I'm in a mood, uh, Brussels sprouts are not safe for me, believe me. Um, God, cabbage, I could just, just, just nail it. I could nail it at 50 meters. Um, with a trusty handgun, which I'm not allowed to have anymore because I live in the UK and we don't have uh, guns of that sort now. Um, in blood sports, yes, I, I have done a bit of uh, shooting of animals, but um, uh, stopped that for reasons that really had to do with not eating them a lot anymore. I just, uh, I'm not a vegetarian, but I just don't eat that much meat. And once I, once I found myself not really wanting to eat the things that I had shot, then I didn't want to shoot them anymore, and so I didn't. And countryside sports, well, you know, I have a lot of uh, acquaintances and, and some friends who are still actively involved in country sports, in, uh, in uh, shooting game, in fishing, in, uh, and, and fox hunting. Not obviously for uh, eating foxes, but to, uh, to keep foxes under control because they're a natural animal and a, something of a predator. Um, it's a traditional way of keeping the fox population in check, um, although we have more of them, not less of them these uh, these days. Um, I'm not a fan of fox hunting on a personal level. No, don't like it. Don't don't like to see people celebrating the kill, the tally ho, the charging across the countryside, the the um. It's just it's, it's to me distasteful to see people enjoying killing things. I, I I accept killing things for meat, for food, and I accept killing things. If it's vermin, but then I think it's a cold, very non-celebratory affair where you go out and you do what you have to do to to control uh, a population of a species that's 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 out of check, that has become unnaturally large and is is causing problems. That are and, and usually, in particular in the case of foxes, they become unhealthy. You get mangy, starving, really sad, poor old foxes when they there are too many of them and not enough to eat. Um, but I would rather knock them off with a 2-2 rifle or a, or a you know, small centerfire rifle at a, not for sport, just for the, the, the unsavory reality of having to, to deal with sick or, or, um, uh, or, or sick animals or animals who, who don't have a future, who are not all going to be able to survive in a, in a limited, uh, um, uh, environment for them. So don't do that stuff anymore. Still know lots of people who do. I don't think they're bad people, but I kind of wish they wouldn't do that. Uh, I, don't, I wouldn't want to be a slaughter man in a slaughterhouse, and I, I don't, I don't, um, I don't, uh, I don't really enjoy the idea of eating too much meat because I know I'm not prepared to 
to kill those animals myself. So uh, I tend to tend to be more of a kind of vegetable and fish sort of person. So I don't have difficulty killing fish for some reason. That doesn't uh, that doesn't give me a problem because I know I'm going to eat it. Um, but I would have a problem uh, killing animals now. So haven't done it for 15 years. Won't do it again. Um, sorry. <laughs> Um, but there you go. It was okay when I was eating them. Don't do it. Don't eat them too much now. Jacqueline, uh, can't make out the last name at all. Uh, Jacqueline, spelled J-A-C-Q-U-E-L-I-N-E, -E, same as my wife, is shown a Jacqueline Anderson. And uh, Jacqueline, I don't see too many of uh, those spellings. Many musicians feel compelled to write and sing about their individual causes or social ramifications of politicians, for instance, Sting and Bono. How do you feel about a musician's role and responsibility to bring political and global awareness to the to the listeners? Well, you know, I, I think I think we sort of should, but I don't think we should we shouldn't be preaching to people to say, well, you know, this is what you do and don't do that. I think we should we should be unashamed and unafraid to deal with issues, to to show our disquiet, our concern for things. To, you know, we we should we should be able to do that, not all the time, but from time to time. You know, let let that stuff. Let that stuff come out. Let our voices be heard. But, you know, we're not there to um, to try and force change. We're there to raise subjects, to show some detail, show some perspective, show some, some other point of view. But you've got to do it in a judicious and careful way. And um, I think if you look back on the careers of Sting or Bono, you know, you're not going to first and foremost think of them as political agitators or or, um, you know, politically motivated poets, songwriters, or whatever. You can look back on a bunch of hit songs, you know, songs you tap your foot to, songs you you hum along with in the car. That, that's basically what these guys do. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, I think it's pretty good that they do. And they take a lot of flack for it, but they do make their, their, um, their points, um, they make them known, and um, particularly in the case of Bono, who's much more forceful about it, it makes him uh, um, go more than one or two steps beyond where I would go in song or off stage. But uh, um, might I might I suggest he kind of sticks with some safe issues? I think he sticks with the things that are. Um, from a political point of view, are going to meet with a broad level of general support. Um, I'd be interesting to know if he was a little more, um, you know, if he chose some more unpopular issues, just how far um, people would extend um, the benefit of doubt or the or their loyalty to him. I wonder if Bono spoke up, told us his true feelings about uh, the Iraq war, for example. You know, would he do that, or would he think, "Whoops, no, that would that 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 would that would seriously, you know, that would seriously engender uh, more than just debate. That would uh, that would uh, that would upset a lot of people." And I'm sure he must have strong views about it. But you know, I think maybe he just chooses his uh, public causes more carefully. But that's just the cynic in me saying that. Hey, what do I know about Bono? I've never met him, but uh, seems like. Uh, Seems like a nice enough young man.